Krasix asks, a studio comes up to you and pitches OSP the movie. What's it about? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> now, that th there's a lot of, like, layers to this. Is it a movie about OSP, or is it, like, OSP given rain or given free rain to make a video or a movie video to make a movie about like a topic <laughs> that we do on our channel because i feel like if we want like a blockbuster <laughs> success we make a journey to the west movie but i will say uh journey yeah. to the west really needs to be a mini series it's just too long for a movie you wouldn't be able to get any kind of process or like catharsis or death mm -hmm. we need to pretend one of the recurring bad guys is the bad guy it's just a problem um <laughs> I feel like if we were making, like, OSP the movie as in, hey, we're going to take these characters and, like, make a movie about them doing fun things in theme with the channel, time travel would need to be involved. Oh, yeah. Uh, or some kind of, like, oh, what's this magic portal or whatever. We have to, like, stage a time travel heist to go back and get as much stuff from the Library of Alexandria as we can fit. And just everyone has to have, like, their <gasps> hacker. Like, got to have, like, the tech guy, the honeypot, you know, just the sign character roles. Wait! <laughs> No, that's amazing! A heist movie with time travel? <laughs> time heist, time oh, heist. Okay, oh, wait, no, that's a better, what was. A better heist movie with time travel. Uh, uh, but yeah, oh man, man. Like, set up like Ocean's Eleven, but like, you're going back in time to rob the Library of Alexandria before it gets burned, and like, somebody falls in love with someone back in time, and it's like, oh no! Instead of uh, Ocean's Eleven, it's Mare Nostrum X High. <laughs> God. And then obviously somebody accidentally uh, ends up being the one who burns down the Library of Alexandria. Oh, of course. We it's need Caesar. an antagonist to it's see Caesar. back to. True it's, to history, it's, it's Caesar. Caesar. Maybe Caesar's the antagonist. Maybe we keep just running into problems with him. Or he's the guy who's, like, trying to do the heist, but then, like, in the process of pulling off the heist, he accidentally triggers... It's like the Doctor Who episode where they burn down Pompeii. We need to keep running into people who are like, oh, what was her name? Oh, that's Cleopatra. <gasps> really? But it just, like, gets more ridiculous. It's like, wow, Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> I had no idea you were around here. <laughs> wow, the famous Charles Dickens. <laughs> but we never leave the time space of the Library of Alexandria. <laughs> Better yet, you guys should have to... <laughs> You should have to go throughout time to build your team for the heist first. So you start the movie, you're yeah. going through, and you're you're <gasps> picking up the historical figures like uh, Bill and Ted style, and you're just grabbing whoever you want to be on your heist yeah. team. So I guess the next question would be then, who is your time travel heist team made Fictional of? characters need to be allowed because I want Edmond Dantes as the <laughs> face of the group. That man is a master of disguise. Make it so. <clears throat> okay, so yeah. I think, do we want to make Caesar the protagonist? I think or Caesar has to be the antagonist. Maybe he, like, <sighs> okay. doesn't know what's going on. He's, like, the antagonist. He's, like, the dupe who we're trying to, like, you know, fool and, like, like. Oh, is he Anne Hathaway? So we can get to the library. Is he the Anne Hathaway? No, basically, yeah. Julius Caesar is the Anne Hathaway, okay. as played by Anne Hathaway, I say. <laughs> I think we should just really let her show her range again. I mean, she did so well in Les Mis. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but, yeah, okay, so Julius Caesar is the dupe. But I think when he finds out, he, like, becomes a bigger antagonist. Mm. Like, rather than her being like, yeah. I need more female friends. Let's hang yeah. and, and, like, honeypot my boyfriend. Um, um, okay, so we start... I think we need to get Da Vinci in here somehow oh, yeah, because yeah. he's going to run yeah. tech, tech guy, obviously. obviously. Yeah, we get Da Vinci. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Behind the flying mm, machine. Mm. Da Vinci just, like, <laughs> furiously pedaling on his ornithopter to get around. Yeah, guy in the, the ornithopter. Yeah. Um, I okay, think... Okay. Hmm. You could make a pitch for uh, Alcibiades being the honeypot. I mean, he's classically... Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We don't even need to get him for the group. He's just already schmoozing on Caesar. When we get there, it's like, oh, that's useful. Yeah. We were going to pitch Cleopatra, but she turns out she's way more useful in the political department. So. Cleopatra's like, I have fun with your games. I have work to do, boys. <laughs> yeah, all right, guys. Yeah, okay, Alcibiades is just running an empire pot. here. Um, okay, okay. Uh, let's see. I, I need to think. I need to think beyond like the the classical world and Renaissance Italy okay, setting. That which I'm of so, Arthur's like, knights do we in. recruit? Um, Lancelot, I obviously. Think... No, are you kidding? Lancelot will screw up the case the minute he lays eyes on yeah, Cleopatra. Yeah, and that makes for narrative tension. <laughs> yeah, actually, no. Lancelot wouldn't be with Cleopatra because he's a strictly one woman guy. <laughs> but uh, he definitely screw things up some other way because Lancelot. All right, Galahad sucks. then. Galahad's pretty good, but he might get whisked away okay. by angels halfway through the mission, and then it's like, ah, oh, we shoot, totally need Robin. No, wait. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Hold on. Uh, of Arthur's Knights, we get Dinadon, because he's the funny one, and we need some comic relief. And we definitely get... We, we aim for Robin Hood, but we actually get Maid Marian. Yes. And we don't notice for a while, because she's such a oh, kicker in the original balance. She, like, has the reveal where she pulls off the hood and the hair just spills out. And we're like, ah, oh, we got the wrong one, but you know what? This is kind of okay anyway. All right, okay. This is really coming together. We, hmm. I'm trying to think. I'm mm. scrolling through our most recent videos to try and find something... Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> something to work with. So, so far you've got your muscle, you've got Maid Marian, right? You've got your honeypot and Alcibiades. You've got your tech guy, your guy in the chair. That's Leonardo da Vinci. You've pulled in, uh, what's his name from the Arthurian Knights, the funny one, to be your comic relief. Dinadon. Okay, here's, here's the B plot. At some point in the heist, we accidentally kidnap Tripitaka. <laughs> <laughs> and then like the rest of the crew is just oh, no. after us the whole time oh jeez <laughs> the reason the library burns oh, down is because Sun Wukong shows up and just yeah. does his impulsive yeah. thing he does oh, his gosh. thing where everything ends up on fire around him and it's like no the library and Caesar's like ah oh, he beat me to it oh that's oh, funny well, it's brilliant perfect well I'll call up some studio execs I think we got a real <laughs> pitch on our hand with one last question here before we uh, sign off for this episode, we got a little follow up to the oh so popular OSP time heist of last time. <laughs> uh, we kind of went over. Hell yeah. <laughs> we went over a little bit who our dream cast was. We laid out the plot of the movie. But um, underscore Finch asks, who would you entrust with the making of the OSP time heist movie? So who's our director? Who's our composer? Who we got on Sydney? You know, what's our mm. let's let's build this crew out here. Indigo, I know that okay. for composer, uh, there is no oh, answer Giacchino. aside from Michael Giacchino that you will allow. So what? But gotta Hans go with Zimmer. him. He's no, my no, boy. No. no, Hans Zimmer. Hans Zimmer is good, but then Zimmer does. Like, I, you, there's so many things that if you're like, man, I really like this score, then you go look it up. It's it's Michael, and I feel like I can always kind of clock Zimmer mm. when I hear him, but Giacchino's just yeah, because he has a turn in every one of his songs. <laughs> It's Speaking it's either the, the metronome or the blah sound, yeah. oh, you know? Um, yeah. But, okay, director, um, I think there are a lot of very good options. I, I'm trying to think of, like, who I know that does, like, you know, historical work or just, like, nonsense meme work. I Oh, no, Taika Waititi, wrong with me. Of course it's Taika Waititi. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But Taika Waititi, New Zealand's just... boy, he has to be the one. It's got to be him. yeah. I was going to say, if there was some way we could get him to team up with Guillermo del Toro oh, yes. and just give us the most whimsical movie in, in existence. <laughs> but I, I feel like del Toro's strengths don't really play to the time heist no. situation. No. It's, it's not whimsical enough. It's not fantastical enough. No, Waititi uh, would do yeah. an excellent time heist because he, he knows historical dramas. He did Jojo Rabbit. <laughs> you, yeah, he did. Uh, what else was um, there, Indigo? We have composer, we've got director, we've got... Um, uh, well, there's other... other. I mean, the cast <laughs> is Nicolas Cage playing everyone except for Anne Hathaway playing Caesar, so that's taken care of. Yes. Um, exactly, yeah, naturally. Well, I could, I could go into the very minutiae of different roles on set, but I feel like that's uh, going to be flexing the film degree a little too much there. Um, so we got <laughs> director, <laughs> composer... I mean, producers kind of who's gonna who's gonna bankroll this? Who are we getting to pay for the OSP time heist? I don't really know. Like, if we are we signing with the studio? Or are we going independent? I guess is a better question. Hey, patrons! Uh... <laughs> <laughs> for the low, low price of nine billion dollars, <laughs> I think gratuitous product placement, oh. like full on Bayformers yes. level, but like completely anachronistic. So Da Vinci, while he's like working on our ornithopter, is like, "Now hold on, everyone! I can't make any progress on this without the burst of energy from my monster energy drink." <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Always has it facing the camera. Uh, <laughs> Julius Caesar's like, "How did you outrun me? It's impossible!" And you show his, your like Nike high steppers <laughs> or whatever. The... Oh no! <laughs> Swear by him. Oh, iconic. I think this plan is amazing, and we should o totally always do it. <laughs> Be like. By the powers of our two flavors of Mountain Dew combined, <laughs> we'll be able to save the Library of Alexandria. Cleopatra, how did you learn all of these languages? Well, you see, I have a subscription to Rosetta Stone, so it's easy with their <laughs> amazing software. Yeah. And thanks to Duolingo's <laughs> premium membership, I don't need to deal with any ads. The problem with bringing Duolingo in is then we do bring up the question of, is the Duolingo owl real and can it affect the events of the movie? The Duolingo owl is Obviously, a Obviously, the Duolingo owl... <laughs> the Duolingo Owl saves the day in the finale, and they're like, thanks, Duolingo! Your premium subscription is very reasonably priced! Don't forget to keep up with your Spanish lessons, uh, whoo! No, so what happens is, like, yeah. they have to get into this room, but the door is locked and they can't break in. The Duolingo Owl figures out that someone on the other side of that room hasn't been keeping up with their Latin lessons, and it's like, <laughs> salve! <laughs> or alternatively, that's how they get Julius Caesar. Like, oh my God. He's like, you fools, how can you stop me? It's like... Julius, we've just been stalling for time. You see, the clock just struck midnight. You've missed a day of your Japanese lessons. 
A shadow looms from the darkness. A single hoot echoes in the night. The owl's like, oh my We never see Julius Caesar again. <laughs> Julius Caesar's like, nani? What does that mean? I love, I love the idea. If I'd been keeping up with my Japanese, I'd know what that meant! <laughs> I love the idea of the Duolingo owl having the same uh, general vibe as Batman in that scenario. Yeah. The question is going to be about the OSP movie. We've, we've cast it. Um, we've, we've established what our pitch is. Bfly1 asks... For both, the OSP movie was a big hit, and a big movie company asked you to make a sequel. What is the uh, plot? What is oh our no. OSP movie sequel? So as a quick oh, refresher, geez. again, we are uh, we're doing the time heist. We've assembled our expert crew to go back in time to save things from the library of save the library of Alexandria. I believe from Cleo yeah. knocking over a candle was the ultimate impetus of the plot. Um, I we've so. got our whole got a little crew figured out. It got, it got yeah. a little twisty. Okay, so what I'm thinking is, because in the first movie, we establish this whole ensemble cast. We, we show how they all interact with each other. We, we really get a feel for their characters. This gives us mm -hmm. a ton of potential for the second movie, where, because we already have the established characters, we can just let them play off of each other. I think if we just drop mm -hmm. those guys into a fun situation, we will have a guaranteed hit, no matter yeah. what the premise is. Like, That's now that true. we've already That's got, true. you know, our, our heist crew, we've got Sun Wukong, we've got... We've got the, the rest of the Journey to the West crew. We've just got everybody on call. We just need to bring them back together again. So, let's see. What kind of inciting incident could we have? Let's see. I, Maybe I... since we have, like, our kind of, not antagonist, but our B-plot from the previous movie and the we've accidentally kidnapped Chipotaka and now Sun Wukong is after us, what <laughs> if we have uh, our inciting incident be based in their sphere there? So we, we kind of dip into the journey to the West. I'm trying to think of like a good Aha! incident in Journey to the West. Well, it's easy. Bad news, guys. Tripitak <laughs> has been kidnapped and not by one of the usual crew. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. We don't know where he Damn, went. We Maybe he's on the moon or something. <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> oh, so this some, is like, all mysterious to go figure, to the moon. <laughs> like some mysterious figure wrapped in shadow, like teleports into the middle of Journey to the West, kidnaps Tripitaka and bounces. And then instead of like going back to one point in time to try and save the Library of Alexandria, the crew has to go across time to find out who uh... stole Tripitaka and where they are. It's like a yes. mystery. Yeah. Yes. yes. And the bad so guy's it, probably it, that it like flips the time... premise, and that way it doesn't have the same thing of like, oh, what are we gonna mm -hmm. like? What one point in time are we gonna go back to this time? No, 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 no. We're we're time hopping, baby. We're going yeah. all over trying to make this work. This is good mm -hmm. too because it makes it it makes it more of a character drama. See, the thing like my mm -hmm. my theory on sequels is like if the first movie tells a, a broader save the world story, your sequel should tell something different whether that's like an interpersonal drama as the center of the story or you know maybe it's a prequel so then it's a gang getting together you gotta you gotta switch up what your story is and we're doing that yeah. here with the hmm. focus shifting from alexandria is burning to tripitaka is lost um, yeah but now it's just who who now, kidnaps tripitaka is the real question who kidnapped tripitaka yeah who it's would tricky. be so bold as to kidnap Tripitaka and who would be so dumb as to think that it would help them? I well, almost I think, think it has to be one of the OSP crew because if we're assembling the heist team then only one of our greatest enemies could also have that time travel technology, right? I don't know. I mean, I feel like that's one way to do it, but that, that might also make a really good uh, red herring as it were. Um, <laughs> Ooh. But it's just like, I, I feel like it should be it should be someone who who makes sense it, with the crew that we've already established, like somebody who'd have a grudge or would want to play people against each other. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, well, OK, hey. so, so for the thing, I am thinking of, of yes, the crew yeah. that we have. Yeah. It, I feel like it should be one of their antagonists from their own story. Right. Who, who comes in to ruffle some right. feathers. So, you Brutus. know, we've got uh, we, we could have it's like Brutus. It is, is Brutus. It yeah, it's Brutus. Brutus. Yeah, we... So we can have the Brutus. Etu Brute thing. Because that means yeah. that we get to team up with yeah. the bad guy from the first movie. We need to go and yeah. call on Julius Caesar. Because oh, yeah. all that roads start leading to Harry. Rome. All roads lead to oh. Rome. Oh. <laughs> okay, so we have our subtitle. So it's OSP Time Heist colon All Roads Lead all to Rome. All Roads Lead to Rome. <laughs> Exquisite. Okay. Oh, we, all right. we can set it up we like Caesar it. is the villain again, but actually it's been Brutus this whole time. Yeah, oh, and like it. we use we like nailed it. clever framing, so so he's always like saying ominous things, but once we learn that it's <laughs> not him, they all have perfectly innocent explanations. <laughs> or like he, he just he, everything he says comes out villainous. He's like, Don't yeah. worry, when this is over, you'll get exactly what you deserve. But he actually means like riches and like acclaim. <laughs> yeah, like one of those boxes of like mystery chocolates. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, no, I, I, I think we, we have we have gold for this film. We we have yeah. struck gold yet again. 
Catch us in like six podcasts when we talk about OSP Time Heist 3. Now I just want to watch that movie. I'm mad this doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, why can't I just think really hard and physically manifest all, the, all my creations so I can watch them without having to do the work of making them? 10 the million subscriber struggle. special. <laughs> oh, don't, don't. We're going to forget. <laughs> and then in like 30 years. <laughs> oh, no. But Red, the internet never forgets. Oh, Lord. So this question comes from Clever Name. To whom it may concern, the studio that's producing the time heist will let you get Michael Giacchino to score it, but to increase marketability, they want the movie to include at least some previously released, at least somewhat recognizable songs. What non-score music will feature in the time heist? So what's our soundtrack? Oh. What do we pull in for those like musical sting well, moments? Well, for one of the montage scenes we will need gas 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 by initial d uh, gas 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 ah! step on the gas. <laughs> and that's non-negotiable i feel like it's like movie law that you have to use that slowed down edgy cover of survivor you know i, I think i've seen that one like everywhere so we got to use that somewhere possibly for the montage where monkey decides to come murder us <laughs> um seems about right God, I'm such a huge fan of those edgy, slowed-down versions of pop songs I that want... they use for trailers. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Um, I feel like our end credit song has to be, like, the time warp from Rocky Horror. Oh, oh yeah. Huh. Oh, you know, we do like that, uh, you know, the scores can get super, super quiet at the end, and someone's going to deliver their, their snappy one-liner, and then we cut to black, and then credits <laughs> pop up. Just hard cut into the time yep. warp. Into the chorus, too. <laughs> into the of chorus. Of course. All the characters are, like, popping in and doing the time work. Like, you know when, like, the credits are rolling and all the characters are, like, Sometimes. popping in on the side? Alcibiades comes in from, like, screen left and just starts doing the time warp. <laughs> Very whimsical. Yeah. I Cover feel me. like what I'm hearing is we need our own not-edgy song to slow down and make edgy for the movie. And I would like to pitch uh, Bring Me to Life by oh, Evanescence. Yes! As ours. <laughs> I'm trying to think of, like, who would be good to cover that. Wake me up inside. Wake, up. wake me up inside. Alita like Battle Angel! Oh. Of course it was Alita Battle Angel. <laughs> you just said, bring me to life, and I know how that song goes, but the only thing my brain is supplying is a really slowed down, edgy cover of um, Sweet Escape. So my brain's just like, take me away, but like really edgy. <laughs> Oh, no, man, God. Bring Me to Life is the wake me up inside yes. one. <laughs> Can't wake up. I, I, I know, but Say my brain me. was not providing that information for me. Oh, that's rough. <laughs> the little librarians muttering around in there were getting the wrong folders. We could I do like the villains dancing because... around song to Sweet Escape. I feel like that's a very like, sure, why not? Of, like I... you know how every villain in every movie has to have like the scene that makes them seem really cool because they're like dancing around to a specific pop song, like usually by Britney Spears or yeah. something. That's a solid song for like our version of that. God, they did at this that rate, in Birds this movie's gonna have a full script by the end of the yeah. year. <laughs> I, I liked. <laughs> I mean, we're basically at this point just composing our own post movie AMVs, which I feel like might be putting the cart before the horse a little bit. <laughs> um, I mean, it's it's the time heist movies. It's time traveling. We can time travel back and then put the horse there after we <laughs> after we get the cart across the finish line. Is Three Days Grace still making songs? <laughs> Oh, let's find out. Let's Google that one. That's a, that's a pretty good question. God, this podcast has been so off the rail. But also, Three Days Grace is still making music, and uh, and not only are they making what? music, but they recently did a cover of somebody that I need to, somebody that I used to know. Yes! Wow! Ah! Return of the King, baby! <laughs> so there's our song for the movie right there. It's a Three Days Grace cover of somebody that I used to know. Oh, good lord. God, that I song was so good. Like, I know that it was just like a really... It, no, I'm I'm not I'm not getting into this. I, we've gone on too many tangents. It's a good no. song. I'll end it there. Okay, here's my pitch for the sort of overarching soundtracks. I think we sort of started to take the form of it. Oh my god, it. we cannot keep doing this. We exclusively do cover songs of other more famous like so we do like the Limp Biscuit oh. cover. We do exclusively artists covering other artists and genres they normally wouldn't cover. And that is our soundtrack for the Ooh. movie. I think that works. <laughs> Or, we can try to get or, bardcore in that's there. That's a dumb idea, and I hate it. Here's a better idea. <laughs> Everything is bardcore. Yeah! <laughs> Soundtrack provided by Hildegard von Blingen. Amazing. Uh, sorry, Indigo, that was needlessly harsh. I just hey, it's it's not good. Needlessly harsh is the cover of my autobiography. Don't get it twisted. This question comes from Blue Flame Prime. To all, just like Marvel, would you have an end credit scene leading to Time Heist 2? So, Time Heist 1 is concluded, everyone's sitting in the theater, they're watching our credits scroll by, 
what's that end credit scene that seeds all roads lead to Rome? You know, where are we? How are we sneaking that in? Hmm. I think that's got to be Julius Caesar finding like the time travel remote control or something. Hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's like the he, obvious yeah. choice. Um, it is. But, because, like, there, there are two schools of end credit scene. There's, like, you know, set up the sequel, or there's just, like, random, mm. that, like, <laughs> in Ant-Man 2, where it's just, like, the ant on the drum kit, where it's, like, serves oh, yeah. absolutely no point, but like, narratively excellent. or anything. Like, what's the, like, sure, we can have, like, Julius Caesar picking up the remote to the time machine, but, like... What's the nonsense? A lot of times, end credit of, scenes of the post credit scene. They ha- the nonsense ones will have mm-hmm. like just a quick cameo of like a beloved but niche character that isn't really worth being in the full. Like there was like a Howard the Duck cameo in one end credit scene at one point. Yeah. Like what is like we could go the yeah. route of like what's a niche historical figure that isn't really going to be featuring in the movie heavily, but would be fun to play with in that sort of universe as a way of doing it. Hmm. Well, I also like. I feel like the simple thing to do, the thing that they mostly do with time plots, is that uh, the end credits or whatever reveal that the timeline has been shifted in some Mm. way. Um, You know, like, you come back, I mean, that's what they did at the end of Umbrella Academy season, whatever, and it's like, oh, you come back and you're like, wow, I'm so glad that everything's totally fine and normal, and then something happens, and you're like, oh, no, and the rest of the credits roll, you know. That would be, like, the easy way to do it. Um, But I'm not sure how. I feel like, I mean... The standard, oh, the future is different now thing is like Zeppelins. You okay, know? concept. There's Zeppelins concept. out there. The, the, yeah. the post credit scene is Da Vinci, like, tinkering away at something on a desk, uh, just, like, working at something, you know, fire lit, you know, very, like, quaint and, and you know, whatever. Uh-huh. Uh, and then he, he, like, puts something away, he gets up and just walks out the room, and as the camera pans, it shows, like... A gramophone, a steam engine, <laughs> like a rifle, and like all this yeah. crazy stuff that he just saw in the present and then like figured out how to reverse engineer. I want. Honestly, that works. Uh, you could also have it so that he's tinkering away and then like a, like a Terminator style time portal opens behind him and the Terminator walks out. <laughs> okay. I think they'd be besties. I think they'd get on great. Riddle, riddle me this though. The portal opens, yeah. a Terminator-like figure walks through it, uh, but instead of Arnold Schwarzenegger, it's like a Mona Lisa look-alike, and he's like, oh, I knew you'd come back for me. <laughs> like, that's why the oh. painting was never finished, because <laughs> Mona Lisa's oh, been time-traveling this whole time. I mean, that's what I call a sequel hook, because it's, and the speculation would go <laughs> yeah, wild. right? <sighs> and then it's just Da Vinci and the robo-Mona Lisa for the next movie. Yeah, because again, she is the Terminator, but it's Mona Lisa. That's why her smile was always a little uncanny valley, because it was actually she was actually a robot the whole time. Yeah, yeah. And as we all know from Terminator 2, Mm. when the Terminator attempts to smile with teeth, it looks very disturbing, so she just has to do the little, like, corner mouth quirk to be like, oh, yeah, this is is how humans do. Show me the smile. Uh, That got way more extreme than my version. I was just gonna be like, oh, Da Vinci, like, sets time forward a few centuries by inventing, like, (laughs) Like fun, like seventeen, eighteen, nineteen hundred stuff, but no, Terminator. Well, maybe apparently. he's also doing yeah. that, and the Terminator Mona Lisa shows mm. up. But da Vinci as our tech guy has a lot of like latitude because the tech guy is always in the end credit scene for some because they're always kind of like doing other stuff on the side. So there's a lot of latitude with Da Vinci mm. to like have stuff going on. Or how about this? Like the the Mona Lisa Terminator takes like one step into Da Vinci's office, looks left looks right and then we cut to da vinci pulling down a lever and then like a just a giant cannonball shoots her off the side and da vinci's like haha try better I've next had time years to prepare You're smiling now <laughs> exactly <laughs> oh god okay all right the plot twist at the end is da vinci invents a rail gun <laughs> how do you say who's smiling now in italian blue because i i don't speak it oh god i don't know what the word for smile is but it's oh. um uh uh, key it's something order, but yeah, no, I, I don't know. <laughs> we'll just have it subtitled. It'll be yes, great. Yes, it'll be yeah. subtitled um, on this podcast. <laughs> or like Da Vinci's tinkering away at something normal, like an ornithopter, and then like there's a ringing noise, and he pulls out like a modern iPhone and is like, "Hello, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm busy." <laughs> Gaza. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean, Caesar found the time machine? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Excellent. Or it's. It, it like there's a like an intertemporal group chat going, it's just like pinging. It's like non-stop. the end of uh, Into Joan the Spider Girls like, over you know? in her war tent. 
Yeah. Yeah, they got yeah. the text chain. Joan of Arc rolls over in her tent and she's got the she's got the phone just <laughs> pinging and she's like, Some of us have a day job. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, or it's like, you know, while, you know, Da Vinci has his, like, iPhone and everything, uh, there's just, like, a Starbucks cup on the table, like Game of Thrones, except this time it actually makes sense <laughs> in-universe. <laughs> yes! Oh, no! Perfect. Well, that is... <laughs> or, uh, we just go full, full, full nuts, uh, and, uh, and the end credits scene is, uh, Dracula has shown up yes. somewhere. Like, the actual Dracula, but he's <laughs> also actually a vampire. Like, we go full Dracula retold, where he's both Vlad Tepish and a re vampire. <laughs> and he just, yeah. like, shows up somewhere. A Chiron pops up, Transylvania, but then the year is, like, 2016, and that's... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's in a business suit, mm-hmm. of course, because, you know, yeah. modern Dracula needs the suit. Yep. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, God. Man. I think we should go full Monster Mash for the second one. Or the third one. So so, so it's Time Heist 2, Old Words Leads Our Own. Time Heist 3 is the Monster Mash one. Yeah, it's basically um, just Van Helsing at that point. It's like, all right, we got the... Yeah, but we make the antagonist, hear me out, we make the antagonist Victor Frankenstein. Ooh, yeah. Who's been sending all of these choice. horrible creations to torment Europe. Oh, we'll give you one guess. <laughs> Pro- and he probably doesn't even remember. He's like, oh, I don't know. I, I got really sad, and then I took a nap, and then some people got murdered, but I wouldn't know anything about that. It's like, oh. <laughs> oh excellent. Well, those uh, cursed right. ideas aside. That- ZZ Digital asks, to all, you've spread out across space and time at the end of a time heist movie to live relatively normal lives. What do you retire to do? And how do you dramatically quit when the gang starts getting back together for the next heist? I mean... Okay. I, I feel like I've got something based off of the uh, the trailer that was made by uh, community member Bill Vousset, uh, mm. wherein uh, the Time Heist trailer that he made, animated by himself, contains a shot uh, of, of Red and I sliding down the side of the Duomo, uh, whereupon a dragon appears from behind it. Yep. So, running with that, I, after the events of the Time Heist uh, film, retire to Florence, whereupon uh, (laughs) I live in relative peace until a different dragon shows up and blows up the Duomo, and then I wake up and choose violence, and then that's how I get going in the second one. So I have to rewind time to before the Duomo was destroyed Mm. so that I can eventually retire at the end of this movie again after heavily reinforcing it with, uh, like, magic shields. So, back to the future. Yeah, basically. Back to the Duomo. <laughs> I think I I want to be in, like, like a cozy but slightly overgrown and a little bit apocalypse preppery, like, treehouse, mm-hmm. just way in the middle of the jungle. And it's not revealed that it's me in there until somebody traipses through it, machete in hand, and oh, is yes. like, one last job, <laughs> and I turn around, and bam! <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's my... I, have, I don't think Indigo as a character has appeared in the time heist yet, as far as our canon is concerned. Uh, and I have a pitch for you, Red. This is where the sequel comes in. Red, I have a pitch for you, because I think I can tie it in to your... Uh... <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Let's hear it. Because as we know, my role on the, in the channel is to harass you two into showing up for us to record the podcast and keep us in time, which is yeah. yes. very, very similar to the role of someone coming back from the future to assemble the team to stop, I don't know, the Terminator, whatever we're stopping in the time heist. <laughs> I'll traipse through that forest to find you, Red. I'm a hack away through the machete. <laughs> it's me, perfect, Indigo. Perfect. Bust open the door. <laughs> we gotta get back for the podcast. <laughs> We're recording I don't tomorrow. Do that you stuff can't anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you never really, you never really stop being a podcaster. That's something that stays with you in your heart. <laughs> Except after Red adamantly refuses uh, the 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 hero's call to to come and record the podcast, you let slip that uh, someone destroyed the Duomo and now Blue is on a warpath, and Red's like, "Okay, let's go." Oh no! <laughs> How bad the Duomo was burned. All right, I'll get my things. <laughs> Grabs like a, yeah. a field mic <laughs> under the arm. Yeah, my my then, USB course, mic. Yeah, to tie it into uh uh to to last week's episode, we find that. The, the masterminds behind uh, the tragic attack on the Duomo were none other than uh, Indifo, Azul, <laughs> and and Red's uh, as of yet unnamed uh, arch we nemesis. Should, if we're yes. going to put them in the time heist uh, cultural universe, we should probably name Red's nemesis at this point. <laughs> eh, I think it's funnier if I never call her by her name and she never <laughs> says it. 
But it's always just like, you again. Awesome. Well, that's a, another, another entry into the, the time heist vault uh, here on... We return to it every once in a while. There's We've cr- tread so much ground here. We've got a, a veritable cinematic universe going. But, um... Oh my god! <laughs> How can I forget the easiest option? Is it okay if you tell me your name 20 minutes into this movie after we've been hanging out for a week in story? <laughs> I will say, watching that movie the first time, I was like, oh, it's weird their team doesn't have a honeypot. And then Anne Hathaway was like, hey, I'm joining your gang. And I was like, ah, that's why. Yeah. They do that in Jupiter Ascending with a bunch of characters, too, but we don't need to talk about Jupiter Ascending. The subtitles say them. <laughs> the subtitles say them, but... <laughs> Dude, the characters out loud in an audible setting? Oh, my God, sorry. Do you guys know the fan theory that Zuko didn't know Katara's name for a while? Uh... Because he never oh actually God. calls her by her name, and uh, at one point when he's talking to Sokka, he's like, "I think your sister hates me." And then he, Sokka says, "Katara? Ah, nah, she's just yeah, she's just a little grumpy." And then he, after that, he starts calling her Katara, but he never <laughs> actually God. calls her Katara before that. God, that's Excellent. so funny. And we are just unhinged. I think we're all down we- just enough sleep <laughs> to have reached that enlightened, that rarefied air of just going oh, yeah. totally bananas. If any psychologist want to just like watch the last ten episodes in a row and just, like, track the progression <laughs> downwards in all of us. Because <laughs> my first thing was like, hey, wasn't there, like, a time-traveling Yu-Gi-Oh villain? We should just get that guy. <laughs> so, you know. Yeah, there was, well, that half of Yu-Gi-Oh, they were t- oh, we, don't, we should probably not. No, from, from the movie. <laughs> from, from the... From, oh, from oh, season, oh, season zero. Right. No, 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 no. Um, no, no, because no, Kaiba if... has that one scene where he flies in a jet that looks like a blue-eyes white dragon and it plays the song You're Not Me in the background. It's That one enjoy. scene? That happens a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm talking about the movie Bonds Beyond Time, where all three Yu-Gi-Oh protagonists team up to duel a bad guy made up specifically for the movie from the even farther future. <laughs>